Uh, my name is Doug Pfeffer. I'm going to be talking about a front-end build that ended up sitting on top of Plone without knowing anything about Plone. I would know nothing about Plone. Uh, oh, this thing's not going to work, huh? Oh, it's a line of sight thing? Yeah. Maybe it just doesn't want to work. Well, okay, that's fine. Okay. Let's stay over here. Yeah, it, was, it, it worked like when we first hooked it up. That's all right. We will survive. No, that's all right. That's, that's a little too needy. I <laughs> I can do that. Uh, oh, there we go. OK, cool. All right. Back to Plone. Don't know anything about it. Still don't, except that I looked it up the other day when, when this thing came up in my email box. Um, so I've done a lot of uh, front-end only work, front-end work, a lot of server-side stuff, mostly custom builds, rarely had to use CMS of any sophistication. Occasionally, I had to use WordPress for something. That was kind of unpleasant. So I'm not It's kind of new to the world. Of, you know, getting deep into CMS things. And I certainly never did a high level like integration effort like a big custom site would require. So what we did, um, I was working with a company at the time called Hard Candy Shell. It's a design strategy company. They do a lot of app work and big content site redesigns. Um, they did uh, the Slate rebranding redesign, which a lot of people had opinions about, uh, New Republic, a bunch of things like that, including, um, project we're talking about right now, which was uh, the KCRW website. Uh, and KCRW, for those that do not know, is kind of a big West Coast music institution. A lot of live bands come through, and they do Radiohead does like a thing there and stuff like that. People like them. They're pretty like legitimate in that world. And, but the website was kind of a weak, like, kind of old-fashioned, just homemade, con like a local radio thing. It didn't really have the, the, the backbone that like a nicer, musical kind of platform should have. So Hard Candy Shell was contracted to kind of rebrand it, kind of reposition it, redesign it, uh, shuffle the content around. And we really made it, or they, I'm not the designer, they des you know, did their whole discovery phase thing and they were out there. Uh, sorted out the new look and feel and they worked with a branding company to come up with a new actual uh, brand and we lost that one. And it ended up looking like this, which was just much nicer, right? And a big emphasis on this thing was like, it was a real rich media player experience. The idea was like, it's not like a blog where you're just reading about the fact that Radiohead came. It's like Radiohead was there and there's all these archives, interviews and things like that. So you should be able to go back and listen to the live show, which they always have, but also dig into the, all their archives they got. So that was kind of the premise of that. Um, and what I was doing with uh, Hard Candy Shell at the time was a lot of these companies a lot of these design companies, their deliverables after the end of all this research process and working with designers and the brand people, their deliverables to their clients, in this case KCRW, might have been just Photoshop files. This is like four or five years ago. This is much more common. They would just give these companies Photoshop files and be like, yeah, this is what the website should look like. There's a hover effect probably, you know, figure it out. Here's a slideshow also. You can also figure that out. And so like we would drop these things off or the designers would drop these off with the client and these you know, these uh, CMS people or database people, whoever, you know, their dev team, would they be on the hook to kind of tease out the interactions, like, from just these, these comps, which doesn't work. It barely worked before, especially it doesn't work now, because you have to take responsive stuff into account. People want things to touch and slide right. And there's just, like, too much to convey if you just give someone, like, a big JPEG. So what we started doing, what they started doing, was trying out... Uh, really building out like more than a prototype. It was like really building out the whole front end shell sort of, complete with all the hover effects, interactive effects and responsive processes and, and kind of faking all the different interactions uh, in the client, in the browser, so everyone could take a look at it and see it on their phones, see it on their big screen, small screens, look at it on their web TV or whatever. And you get a much better sense of like how this thing is gonna work. And also the people that are actually on the hook to implement it, uh, in theory, it saves them a little bit of work. Uh, the Jazz Carter folks might think otherwise, but in theory, like, in theory, it saves them a little bit of work because they don't have to actually then go pull in front end guys to figure it all out. They don't have to sit down and hash out the structure because it's already been done. And technically, if, you know, if I did my job okay enough, 
the, all the cross browser stuff was mostly sorted out and everything that was like had to be plugged in was like mostly ready to go. Um, so that's what we got. That's kind of that. So that was the gist of it. So what I was tasked with was um, building out this front end for this thing, and I didn't know anything about what was going to be actually how this thing was supposed to run, how this thing was supposed to operate. Uh, I, yeah, I had no idea Plone was behind it. I didn't know what was going to be behind it, but it wasn't really my problem, which is kind of a weird position to be in because I also, as a server-side developer, sometimes I'm going through the front end and I'm just like, I guess this is how the data is going to work. I, mean, I assume like, I assume that there's going to be some kind of response that comes back when you sign up for this thing. So like a lot of times for the sake of the demonstration and the feeling, I had to fake a lot of like load times and submissions. Like this newsletter sign up button, just some jQuery. I kind of had to like fake a loader and stuff and fake this kind of confirmation and message that would come back. And it was just full of comments like, you know, server side folks, this is where you're actually going to want to hook into some kind of API. There's going to be some JSON or some XML is going to be coming back. Well, good luck with it. And I felt a little funny about doing that because I'm like, well, someone's got to figure that out. But it's, again, in this case, uh, luckily it turned out, and this is the magic of Plone, apparently it was just fine because the website works really good. We're, we're just like the, the demo is supposed to do. <laughs> so uh, an odd thing that comes with doing these kind of front end, like blind front end mockups is you have a lot of this kind of placeholder code where you just like, we're just like, yeah, this should really do something. Put a loader indicator on there and just, I don't know, I, you know, toss it over the fence and someone else is going to figure it out. And I guess it works out. I kind of always was wondering if I was going to get jumped by the server side people because they had to deal with all these assets and JavaScript piles of garbage that I had to send over to them to figure it out. But it seems to be OK. So thanks, thanks guys. Thank um, <laughs> so that was a weird thing. It just, that's like a weird thing. I don't know if, are, are you all front end developers? Are you all Plone developers? I don't know. A anyone touch anything? Any, is anyone only a front end developer? No. OK, great. That doesn't really matter. It's pretty it's interesting. Kind of it's a mix, right? Kind of everyone, you have to touch it all. Yeah. So, OK. So, uh, so let's talk about the workflow sort of and how, like, what we actually, what I delivered to Jess Carter to integrate into Plone. So I found using these static site generators, I saw there was another talk actually about static site stuff. Um, I missed, I don't know if it was today or it was. It was yesterday. It was yesterday. Yeah. Lector, yeah. Yeah. Okay, was that, the, was that the tool, the system? Was I this didn't static yeah. site generator? Yeah, it's a new one. I guess. Okay. Okay, there's a ton of them. I just leave, looked it up. There's like two, at least two, just listings of these things, um, which is great. Now, like, so what is that? For, for those that do not know, a static site generator is just like some toolkit. If you need to make an entire, a lot of content sites, for example, like if you're trying to make, if you've got archives of articles and content and streaming videos and stuff like that, most of the time you don't really need like a Rails server side or even a Drupal thing or Plone or whatever on the back end. You can just pretty much just dump out, it's just HTML, right? It's all you really need most of the time. But the, the difficulty is not like serving it, because it's just a bunch of HTML. But the difficulty is as, as someone who's actually producing it, and you've got to update the header because like, there's a promotion coming along. You obviously don't want to go and update 3,000 uh, HTML files. You don't need PHP. You could just do it with PHP and server side includes and stuff, but that's just weird and lame. And also, then you've got to host it anyway. If it's just all static stuff, you can just put it on S3 bucket or some host, and it doesn't matter. It's like out of your life. It's beautiful. So that lent itself to these kind of like front end only builds because I could have the tooling to not just be playing with plain HTML files and plain JavaScript files and CSS. I would get like the tooling of like a kind of a somewhat like development y environment on my end, but the deliverable was actually either a stack of HTML files we could all put online and review in real life. And also I had the artifacts of the build that the back, uh, you know, the server side people could then kind of leverage, which I will get into. Um, I used one called Middleman. There's a lot of them three or four years ago. This is the one that I kind of liked. Uh, it's Ruby based, which I like. I like Ruby. Um, this is some of the stuff that it kind of it gives you. Basically, you can put a bunch of HTML, uh, uh, a bunch of templates. So ERB, excuse the typo. ERB is like a templating language, a Ruby-based templating language. And you can just kind of use your includes, and you can loop through stuff. And there's some image helpers. And it just kind of makes it handy. It gives you a bunch of helpers. Um, SAS, uh, do people know what SAS is? 
Yeah, everyone knows what SAS is, right? It's like a compiled CSS thing because writing just CSS is kind of a pain and it's not that great. So SAS lets you like sits on top of CSS and compiles, compiles down to it. Um, Compass is a really useful, if you're doing a lot of SAS stuff, Compass is a really useful kind of toolkit that you can use with it. It just gives you tons of utilities. Like it will take care of uh, weird server side hacks. You don't, so you don't have to copy and paste the same stupid H, uh, CSS, like seven lines of CSS for your different float fixes or whatever, or vendor prefixes. It does a lot of that stuff for you. So this all makes it pretty easy to go about building out this front end because, again, the end result is just HTML. It's just HTML at the end of it, but you don't want to sit there in a big sea of HTML because that's just that's a nightmare. So it kind of looks like this. What, you, what, what I ended up with as I'm building this is pretty much a page for uh, a page for every page, an HTML page for every page. It's not entirely HTML. So this is like the layout. This is like the big master template, basically the header that all the other stuff gets plugged into. And you know, it's, it's mostly HTML. We've got some helpers and stuff like that. We've got the partials I mentioned, which are just like shared components that we can use all across the site. Um, and a lot of content sites do have that because you've got like your about, like the bio, like the author's byline is on every article. If you've got seven variations of the article, you don't want to actually be copying and pasting the HTML. One, because it's a headache for you as the developer. Two, it's a jerk move to the people that are implementing it because they've got to go fish out the same HTML a hundred times and try and just, I don't want anyone looking at it being like, is this footer indented differently on page X than page Y because it's a different footer or just because like he forgot to tab it, you know? So this way you can kind of, you know, mandate, like this, just trust me, this is the same markup. Like you can use this everywhere we're using a footer, this is the footer. Uh, so, you know, it gives you some, it gives you some amount of, of uh, organization that's nice. You have directories for things, people like directories, you put your fonts in one thing and uh, image, images in something else. Uh, and you can kind of build that, so like this is the, this is like the live, you know, the live site. Uh, just for navigation purposes, you know, we generally have like a table of contents. So when we host this thing so everyone can review it, it's client review time, we can be like, okay, everybody, go to like the staging server and let's review the music episode page. Everyone can go and click on it. And just an easy way to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, I find it's helpful to, helpful to version the directories. So the person that dialed in three days ago, they pull it up on their, on their Amazon Kindle or whatever, they're, however they're reviewing it, they're not looking at like the three day old version. We just, otherwise you gotta be like, hey, you please clear cache and review, uh, you know, reload and that's a pain. So version these things, host them, everyone gets to see them and everyone kind of gets a little taste of, of what, uh, what, how the thing's actually gonna work, which makes reviewing it easier. It makes like, it just makes feedback easier because otherwise you've got these JPEGs and you've got a slider you got a carousel on there and no one really knows how it's going to work and you go through all the effort to build this carousel out or some, some like inane thing and the client's like, I don't like it sliding like that. I want it to slide like this. And then you've got to go back and code it again. So this way, if it's out the gate, it's a working prototype, you just are farther along that approval flow and you, you spend less time looping back around because there's less surprises. Uh, especially if you were starting the prototype stage, there's like no real room for the client to be like, I didn't know this thing was a vertical thing. I thought it was a left to right. I don't know. Whatever, you know, whatever stuff, miscommunications happen. If you've got a working kind of prototype, it just makes it easier. Uh, so this, again, is an example of using the shared code thing. It, it's easier for me because I've got a little blog post kind of uh, module, and I don't want to be copying and pasting that code a hundred times. Plus, for the sake of the, vi for the visual sake of the uh, review experience, it, the content's got to differ because we have to show like what happens if there's a blog post, you got five blog posts in a row, what happens if one of them, you know, has 300 characters in it, what happens if uh, one of them is like, I don't know, has some other uh, blur on top of it or something like that. You want to show it all, but you don't want to just keep copying and pasting that. So that ends up looking like this. This was like our standard like module. And we could show like this is, like if there's an audio player, it's going to look like this, uh, you know, you, you, get, you get what this looks like, right? Um, and it just kind of provides that framework so you're not actually doing that and then other people that have to implement it come along and they see like, oh, clearly, like, there's no question. Every blog post overview is gonna look like this and granted, yeah, in the code, like if there's an audio player, this markup has to be kind of omitted, but 
it's not on anyone to guess it. It's like it's not a it's not a formal it's not a formal proof of like how anything works. It's just all a suggestion, um, which is kind of a funny. It's kind of a, a a weird thing to be providing this markup and being like, I swear this is pretty much how it's going to work in the browser, but it's still on you to actually make it happen in the browser. So. Uh, especially as it gets towards launch, like things are going to change and maybe Plown or whatever you're working isn't really going to want you to do a certain thing. Uh, so the, in the best case, you get the stack of HTML and it's kind of like a suggestion. It's like you, you really ought to do it like this. Like we know it works good and the client approved it, but uh, it's up to you how you want to do it. Um, so we can even click around a little bit, just like for the sake of it, because why not? Can I open this? No. I can't even get out. I can't even get out of this thing. Let's see. How do you do this? Great. So there we go. Right, so this is just the, the thing of, this is, what I, this is what we delivered. This isn't what necessarily went live, but it's an example of like how we built out almost everything as if it was going to be a real thing. So we've got our, our spinning music player. And you have to make a lot of assumptions. Like this thing is technically, like technically we wired it up to be a player. Like it went through the trouble of making sure you could drag and drop it, you know, making sure the timer is ticking. Uh, making sure like there's a mute state and all these widgets to work because then uh, as far as the interface goes, nothing is left to interpret um, when it comes time to do it. And you can, if, you're, if you're good, you can sneak in some Easter eggs. And, and Jess Carter let us get away with this for a while, but we got a Konami, we got, I think it's not there anymore, but, but I think we got the Konami code in here too. It looks like it. Up, up. Got a nice spinning egg in there because it's like, <laughs> It's like an actual Easter egg. It wasn't my idea, but I'm like, they're like, do you think we have time to put in the spinning egg? And I'm like, I think so. I think we can, I think we can make that happen. Uh, so this is cool because everyone just, you know exactly what the music player is going to look like. You know how the progress indicator works. It's not bulletproof because it's not a real player. And the more like complex the functionality gets, the kind of the goofier the prototype gets because I really have no, I don't even know if the media player can stream in this way. Like it might turn out just not to work at all, but it's like a best case scenario you get this kind of working functional thing. The client likes it because they understand it. They're like, yeah, this is what the media player should look like. The, the implementers kind of get a sense of it too. And the design, and most importantly, the designers can sweat it out to their heart's content. Because as I'm sitting in the middle here, like the designers are also my client as well, because I'm a freelancer. So Hard Candy Shell was my client. Like the KCRW is technically, but like in my mind, my clients are the designers that I'm trying to you know, I have to please them, so they're not like this guy's not giving us any support because we're trying to make this thing look good. It's got to be good, it's like it's got to build good, so this guy's got to do it. But I also know in the back of my mind my client is the Plown people in this case because I can't really in good conscience build a crazy unworkable thing that is only going to work on like the nightly Safari build because that's just like, <laughs> that's just like not, it's not fair, I don't know, no one's going to be happy with that because then the client's finally going to get it, KCR is going to, you know, KCRW is going to have this thing and uh, and the designer's gonna be like, well, it worked in your demo. I'm like, well, it worked in your demo because you have like the, the 10K screen. Like it doesn't work for anyone else. So you kind of got to be like that sense of reality, being like, this is awesome. Like what you're suggesting is awesome. But like there's no, the real time blur is not gonna work. It's cool, it's working in our like real prototype. And it's cool you found an example of a CSS online, but like I'm not letting that go into like production code. Um, so you kind of got to be the bad guy too like that when you're in this position. Uh, so it's useful. It's, it's useful because everyone just like gets what gets what's happening here. Highly recommend it. Uh, what else we got here? Yeah, I don't know. Stuff. We got stuff. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, just a little bit about like the beauty of of kind of doing this thing, this prototype. Like you could you could. I know a lot of people will. Forego, depending on the technical chops of the design shop, they might forego uh, doing a lot in Photoshop or Sketch or whatever they're doing at all and just jump right into 
prototypes in the browser, which is great, because then you really, you, I mean, this isn't like novel, this isn't a, a brilliant observation I'm going to make. Other people have written books about it. Like, this is people's lives, it's like the prototyping workflow. But you get a lot more out of that kind of thing, because everyone's looking at a working thing immediately, and you don't go down a weird rabbit hole of someone's fantasy that only works in this strange limited resolution in Photoshop, and like, it's like, well, it worked on my browser. Like, so many times I'll get a design, and I'll be like, well, what happens if the browser's wider? They're like, oh, I, what, I mean, like, you know, the browser gets wider, but yeah, there's, there's these implications, and you have to fight those things. You deal with those immediately when your thing's in the browser, um, and they can't, like, hide from it, because a lot of times when it's just a design file, they can kind of just dodge the bullet a little bit. They can be like, I don't know, like, it's, that's, your, that's your problem, you know? Or, and, and sometimes I can say, like, well, it's the implementers, it's, it's the plone people's real problem, but I don't want to do that. So you kind of have to fight it out. You kind of got to get it done earlier. Um, you see pretty easily if, like, design decisions are going to be actually just stupid. Like, say a fixed header in theory with a certain rollout effect, say it's like, it sounds really cool. It's like, oh, as you scroll, you see, like, the I don't know, something spins or something as you scroll, all this stuff, like, oh, it's really useful and awesome. Then you see it in the browser, it's just like, it's garbage, it's just distracting and a nuisance. So you can throw it out, and you haven't sunk hours into the designs and hours into, like, multiple responsive versions of it just to find out that it's going to be an unhelpful feature. Uh, the client likes it, too, because they can sit at home and look at it in the computer, which is dicey, too, because you don't want the client to play with the markup that's not fully vetted for too long. So if you can give them markup, of a prototype, you got to take it offline immediately after the meeting. So otherwise, <laughs> they're going to be emailing. Because otherwise, they're going to be emailing it around, and they're going to be looking at it on, on their on their Kindle or something like that. Some crazy thing that's just not ready for production. Uh, so you've got to you got to. There's a lot of like hand holding, I guess. Like you, uh, yes, this is working in the browser, but this is not. Just because it's in the browser, this is not what's going to be on the website. Like, just look at this. Just look at the header. Do you like this font? Like, okay, good. This is the way it's going to look. But leave it alone. Like, you can't hit it that hard. Uh, and again, like, when you have the markup and the thing launches, and the slideshow is just broken, or, or the hover effects don't work, or the loading indicator is off to the right or in some stupid place, then I can blame the. Plone people, the implementers can be like, look, the, I know the designs, like the designs weren't really that big. This didn't happen, but in theory. <laughs> I'm like, look, the, 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 the CSS is here, like the markup's here. Like technically, like technically you know how this thing's supposed to work. You know on mobile, like we have the momentum figured out. Like we have that easing animation that we had to sweat out with the designers. Like that's working in the browser here. Like how come it's not working in the production thing? So that's something you can kind of, you can't really, no one can fake a certain amount of it or say I didn't understand or I didn't know it when you've got the actual markup. Um, trying to think what else we got. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, are there any questions about the internet? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, sir. I mean, I feel like a bunch of my questions are probably like group questions. Like how, like structurally, and how, like how close did what you guys launched with, you know, how, like how much did the code change? Might be useful for you to just do a little uh, two minutes. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because it's yeah, not it's not right. like it's both of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. It looked great. When it launched, it was like that. That's exactly it. Right. Except for like things that like I knew like everyone knew was gonna change, like the streaming implementation, no one knew how that was gonna go. Right. Right. Um, so so we what we got from them was was perfect for what we needed. As you said, oh, that's there, nice. there was a middleman. The middleman setup, which, you know, it's, it's ERB, it's Ruby templates, it's a little weird for us by not but it's templating language, right? And there was a SAS setup, there was all this stuff. We just took that index.html that you saw there, the one that, the generated version, so the compiled version where all this stuff had gotten pulled out, where there were little module elements we pulled that out, we made that a Diaz of theme. The compiled CSS that came out of SAS and Compass put in a Diaz of theme. The, the, the Diazo thing sounds awesome, by the way. <laughs> that was like super impressive. I, I went through your email again. Is you can just take regular markup and make the CMS understand it? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, yeah. More you, or less? You, yeah, you take the markup and you have, the, you have this intermediate thing that takes the CMS markup and your markup and uses rules to put the CMS content into your markup. Um, and so that's what we did. And we continue to this day for the KCRW site, which I do kind of maintenance on and do development, to use that middleman um, to to build our theme as we make changes to it. So we can test out 
uh, front end changes, prototype them in the static site generator, which we keep using. We're working from that same repo, we just have a branch on it uh, that we use for the production site. And, uh, and, and just continue making these changes. It, it generates sprites for us. Um, it compresses all the images. It does some special retina image thing for all the theme images. Right. It just does all of this great, magical, wonderful stuff that us back-end developers don't normally think about. Um, and then that's, that's the Diazo theme that gets you sort of the wrapping of the site. Um, and then for the dynamic things like this, um, in some cases, these are tiles. Um, in the clone sense of tiles, there was already a piece of HTML behind this that you put data into. Right. So we just took that little modular snippet of code that was called like, you know, show dot show module dot erb or something like that, and turned it into a, a ZPT and made it a tile um, and rendered it with the content provider. Um, and so, so we already had these little HTML snippets uh, that we could turn into ZPT and put a little class behind. And suddenly we have all these modular things that we can place wherever we need to in the page. Sometimes they'd be a portal. But either way, we've got the HTML already for them. All the CSS is being built with the static site generator. Um, and so we used it pretty much unmodified. Um, there are a few, we, what we did do is we went into, uh, we're using collective.cover for, for our sort of uh, flexible page layout engine because Mosaic wasn't around at the time. Um, and so we had to add like a custom grid layout engine that's got some portable grid layout to use the grid layout uh, that was implied here by the CSS and all that. And we probably could have done it the other way around and modified all of his stuff and the grid that it used, but why? Like he's that's, the that's the point, because I already, you know, we already sweated it all out. So the, the, hope, the hope is that it's, it's workable enough. And it sounds like, you know, to bring back to Plone, I guess, it sounds like you're able to do that. I think if I gave this to like, a word, I don't know. What's the what's like a, the laughing stock of CMSs from the Plone point of view? What do you all make? Fun? What's the? It's probably WordPress. It's probably WordPress. <laughs> that's like that's pretty much it for everyone. Like I would imagine, like I would imagine it would be unpleasant to try to turn bend this around. I'm sure it's doable. People do whatever they want. But like I imagine it would be unpleasant. But it sounds like you were able to. Plone was variable enough that you made it happen. We did our best. Yeah. And it worked. It worked. Yeah. You know? It was you know most of the difficulties had nothing to do with. Most of the difficulties had, had nothing to do with the, the front end itself. It was more about the logic of getting things and fetching things and what shows in the pages and how these little things that weren't you know, thought of in the design process fit in place where this other thing was. Yeah. You know. And just abandoning functionality that it turned out they couldn't afford. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A lot of times when we were building it out in the design side, so the designers have these big ideas that they invented when they were like out for drinks with the client and then it comes to me to build it out and I'm like I, I don't know if this is going to happen I don't know if this is technically feasible if they had this data even right. or if they can stream it like that or if you can hop around like I don't know if the audio server supports this but still again like it, like there's a, like a funnel of feasibility as it goes through the layers to like the you know the final implementers and where like and what the servers are running on stuff like that where is it hosted they have their own ops uh, yeah, we host everything on, on AWS, so I manage the ops for Okay, it. so, yeah. Anybody got other questions? <laughs> Great. Uh, any clone CSS trickling through, or, or is it all? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> what was the question? Can you repeat uh, it? How much of clone CSS ends up in impacting the design here? Um, we minimize it. So I think there's like one one or two CSS files from Plum that we pull in through the resource registry. Um, the theme itself is coming through DS, so we don't register any of the theme CSS. Theme CSS is one huge CSS file that gets compiled, basically. Um, so the Plum CSS is in there. Most of it is only there for logged in users. The only logged in users are the content managers. Uh, but yeah, they, they edit in the themed UI. So the UI you see when you visit kcrw.com, that's, the, that's what they edit in, and it's got the green edit bar on top. Um, so it's plum, you know, with the music player on top, you know, a bunch of custom blocks and tiles and things. A lot of tiles, a lot of blocks. It's <laughs> a lot of modules in this thing. Yeah, oh yeah, they shared. <laughs> 
so Doug just just puffed this up. These are the, the modular elements that, that he developed for us that we were able to use All right. uh, in various places and reuse. There's like a million of them. Like there's so many, like there's so many, like th this site specifically feels like it had a lot of tiny content chunks that just spread out everywhere. Right, you know? right. And a lot of these like popular episodes, that's, that's a module, but it's filled with a whole, it's filled like four of one other module. Yeah, and it shows up multiple times. I mean, just like, it's just like template reuse. It's nothing crazy, but this is like, this just helps us organize it, you know, and how it's ultimately implemented, I don't know, but it sounds like having it cut up like this ahead of time at least gave some kind of guidance for how you folks might share it. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing that, like, looking within, say, the home page and seeing that there was just a one line that said, go look at this module. Right. gave us a clue that we're going to need to build a reusable module for that purpose. Uh, and so, so, yeah, I think a good takeaway from this is, like, building something in a static site generator like that uh, in a module that can really help you think about what, what goes in. That's it. Anything else? Great. Great. You got it.